All right, so we're talking about radio surgery today, and um, and this is what this is one of the special procedures that you guys all encounter in medical physics, you know, among all the others such as HDR, TBI, that kind of thing. Uh, and radio surgery has evolved quite a bit from from where it started back in the 50s to where it is today. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about. There's a slide here with the history on it. So let's. Uh, Let's look at the outline of the, the outline of this talk today is a, first a very short history of state attractive radio surgery and then uh, sites what sites we treat with SRS, the difference between conventional and radio surgery treatments. What is what is it that we call radio surgery today? And when I started this field there was a definite distinction between radio surgery and 3D conformal radio uh, 3D conformal radiotherapy. Today things are coming together and you'll you'll understand why. Uh, the limit sources of uncertainty in radio surgery very important limitations of radio surgery and modern radio surgery equipment. So short history. It goes way back. 1949, it started in the Karolinska Institute in, in Sweden. It was developed by Lars Luxell. And you'll hear his name. He's like the granddaddy of radio surgery. You'll hear his name uh, a lot when it comes to the history of radio surgery. He was a neurosurgeon and Bjorn Larsen was a radiation biologist. Uh, and they started, I believe they started with protons back in 49. Protons were then used in the USA in the 60s for radio surgery. And the first gamma knife prototype is made and the first patient is treated in Sweden. So in 67 is when the first gamma knife is, is used. And you folks know what a gamma knife is, right? I mean, it's a, it's a treatment machine that has, that has uh, many cobalt 60 sources and the sources converge down at one point. Okay? And there are very little moving, but the advantage is there are very little moving parts. The only moving part is the patient going into going into the uh, into the machine? Into the machine. Just turn this on. Uh, so that's that's why the machine is attractive. That's why that uh, the unit is attractive. There's very little moving parts, and they tell very high accuracy in treatment. Uh, so in 1981, UCLA treats patients with the first gamma knife in America. And that gamma knife was a gift from the Swedes. So Excel gave the UCLA that gamma knife. In the early, in the early 1980s, Linac, the Linac, linear accelerator starts being used for radio surgery. And cone-based SRS uh, takes, takes hold. And the cone-based the cone SRS, the cone is here. I brought a, I brought a cone to show you guys. This is a 15, this is a 15 millimeter cone. Okay. And uh, it's an average size cone. They go down to about the smallest cone that, that you'll see is a four millimeter cone. The largest cone you'll probably see is a five centimeter cone. We've got a five centimeter closet blueprint. Uh, so that's pretty much average size. So cone based radio surgery starts to take hold in the, in the early 80s when linear accelerators uh, begin, begin to be used for radio surgery. So why is it so heavy? It's made of wood. It's made of lead. And it's made of lead because it's got, it's got to stop the. Uh, uh, it's got to completely attenuate the protons. Now, the way this is drilled out, it's also a divergent hole. Right? It's not a straight hole. And the reason it's divergent is because you get a sharper edge, right? A sharper point of So, in 1990, uh, let's see, uh, CyberKnife uh, Cyber actually started in 1990. The concept started in 1990, and it was FDA approved in 1999. You folks have heard of CyberKnife. There's one at right now. Mm -hmm. You've seen the one at Luthret. Actually, I went to see it a couple of days ago. Oh, maybe last week. Last week. Let's see. Last week, uh, there's one at Lutheran. There's one at Northwest Community Hospital. There's one at Christ Hospital. I think that's it. I think it's good, but... So there's there's about three or four in the area. I know there's one in Community Hospital, which is the one you guys are gonna go on a field trip. That's a monster. There's about four in the area. Uh, so the cyber app starts in, in 1999, starts to be, uh, is FDA approved in 1999. In 1997, uh, we start to see MLC-based SRS. Okay, so the advantage of MLC is that now you can conform the shape of the radiation beam to the shape of the tumor. Previously, you were confined to spheres. Okay, so this is a cylinder, but as you arc around the patient, it becomes the acidose distribution from the sphere. So you were confined to spheres, and what you had to do is either Treat the, you know, cover the entire, cover the entire tumor with a sphere, which means that if the tumor was just as an example, shaped like a banana, you treat, you treat all this healthy tissue that where there's no tumor. Okay, 
but what we, what we did sometimes is we would use multiple multiple cones and we would put the separate isocenters and we would try to by separating the cones by joining them you could you could kind of make a distribution that looks more like football shaped uh, but the danger in that is that the overlap area got really hot so you have to ensure that that overlap area was right in the tumor okay so there's some limit there's, there's big limitations with just using cones so MLC was a huge advantage the first MLC based serotactic specific machine was an Novalis machine. We had one at we had one at Evanston. Um, we got rid of it a couple of years ago. The Novalis is a six just a six MV machine. That's all it does. Is it has a very high dose rate, 800 MV per minute, and it has a built-in MLC with three millimeter leaves. And the MLCs have 52 leaves in it. It's pretty small. Maximum field size of a Novalis 10 by 10. Okay. So as you can see, you buy this linear accelerator for for stereotactic only, but you're limited to 10 by 10. You still have to create the vault and put the shielding in, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't treat you can't treat too much with this. Okay. So this we have we had an IX next we had a 2100 C next to the Novalis and we wanted to upgrade it. So so what we did is we got rid of it, got rid of the 2100, and we bought an IX. In the transition period, where do we treat our patients? So we said, well, let's treat them on the Novalis. But we had this 10 by 10 limitation. So all we could treat are you know prostates. And maybe some partial breast. That's all we can treat on the Novalis. So that's a limitation. Uh, today's today's machine. There are more stereotactic specific machines today. The Novalis NTX. The NTX has a maximum field size of like 40 by 40. So it's a full NX plus it has high definition MLC. Uh, and then there's also the Trilogy. Okay. And the Trilogy also has a has a 6 MV mode with a very high dose rate. 6 MV at 1,000 MU per minute. Per minute. Okay, and there's a couple more, and I'll show you a couple more machines in a minute. So that's the evolution. That's the evolution. That gives you an idea of the evolution. It started back in the 40s and 50s with protons, 60s protons, then 67 gamma knife. Okay, cobalt 60 sources, uh, and 81 gamma knife. Then linear accelerators in the in the 80s, and then an MLC based SRS. So that's the progression. So. What's important about SRS? It's important to get the patient in the correct position because SRS implies very few number of fractions, right? So if they have a very few number of fractions, you want to deliver a high dose to those few number of fractions, then you want to be sure that you're putting the patient in the right spot. Okay? There's no, uh, you, can't, you can't apply a very large margin because you're giving a very high dose. So the, the bigger the margin, the, more, the, the higher the number, the higher the amount of side effects if the margin gets bigger. So you want to keep your margins really tight. So here, to keep your margins tight, you have to ensure that the patient goes in the same place every time. I mean, if it's a single shot, the patient has to go in the right place that one time. If it's fractionated uh, radio surgery, you have to make sure they go in the right place for the, for the number of fractions that you treat. So these are the way, these are uh, masks that are used and have been used over time. This is the brain lab mask to, to position the patient correctly. And to not just to position the patient correctly, but to immobilize the patient so they don't move during treatment. So this is a brain lab mask. It's it's made of aquaplast material. There's a solid aquaplast over here and over here. And then there's a mesh that goes over that. And then there's also a mouthpiece that goes inside. And so there's, there's a soft aquaplast mouthpiece that the patient bites down on. And that soft piece gets melded to this top piece, to the hard piece. So that becomes one unit. There's also a there's also a solid and mesh aquaplast behind the patient, and the way that's made is there's a there's a head holder. So this is this is behind the patient. This is the head holder. This is like a side view of this patient. The patient's head. Uh, they'll put aquaplast material like a little cradle on here, and then the patient's head fits in here, and and so they lie back. As this hardens, the patient's being supported by this headrest on the back. So there's an aquaplast behind him, aquaplast up front, and then when they treat, they don't need this this piece anymore, this head holder, because the aquaplast is hard. Okay. So now it's a very solid, very solid, very reproducible way of uh, mobilizing patients. And what's nice too is that their this is open and their head is open, so there's the, the the claustrophobia factor is not not as great as a full face mask. Um, let's see. And then so here's some other masks. So that's called a relocatable mask because you could put the patient in the same place over and over 
for many times. This is also relocatable. This one is it came before this one. This one's a more of a renewal mask. This is called a Gil Thomas Cossack frame. We used this for many years for Lutheran. And so we used, we first, but Lutheran, we started a radio surgery probably in 1995, 96. And we were using these cones. This is a radionics cone, by the way. Radionics is one of the companies that makes radio surgery equipment, or made. They don't, they're not around anymore. And so we were doing radio surgery. And then, then when we started using radiotherapy, which is fractionated radio surgery, we wanted a way of immobilizing the patient in every fraction. So this is what was available from radionics. And the way it works is there's a mouthpiece here. Uh, and then and that's that's screwed onto this metal frame. Okay, so this becomes a rigid piece. And then there's some straps, the straps that go around the patient's head. You can see how the frame fits on the patient. And then there's a, a occipital mold back here. So what we would do is we would take this soft plastic material that would harden and put it back here in the occipital plate. And then we would put some, we would squirt some rubbery dental material into this here. It was a, it's actually an epoxy. It's a compound of two materials. When you put them together, they harden. So we would, we would squirt this in here. It wouldn't be attached initially. And then we would tell the patient to, and I would do this. At first, the dentists were doing it. And then it would take too long. So the physician said, why, why does it the physics just do this? So I would squirt this in the mouthpiece, and I'd tell the patient to open up, and I'd put it in their mouth. And then I'd tell them to like kind of hold it. So I was like a dentist. And then I'm holding it. And then I would make sure that it was straight. And then in about five minutes, that would settle. Okay. And then the challenge was taking it out. Because this thing was, it was in there, tight. And so I would say, OK, I'd say, OK, now you're going to feel a little bit of pressure. as I, a, a little bit of, of a tugging as I pull on this. Sometimes I have to really push hard. And, and, I was, and then when I took it off, I would always look to make sure there's no tooth in there. <laughs> so, you know, some people have loose teeth. And so I look at it, and then I put it back and make sure it went in the right place again. Some patients would complain about, you know, it would, it would scratch their gums, so I'd have to like shave some of the, some of the stuff off. So it was really like being at the dentist and getting a um, mouth mold, a mouth guard. So after that mouth guard was made, it screwed onto the frame, and then we would put the occipital panel with this goop behind it on the patient, and we would tighten these straps as tight as we could. There's a loop here, strap comes around, and there's Velcro. We would pull on the straps as hard as we could because what, what we all want to do is push the mouth guard uh, against the strap. You want to make that really tight. And then we pull that up and then we cut it at a point and draw a mark. Okay? And so that strap had to go to the same mark every time. Then, how did we know that it went to the right spot? Besides the marks on the straps, we would use the space helmet. Okay, so before treatment and actually before CT, we would put this on here and you see these holes? Here, there's one here, there's one here, and there's a third one back here, right there. Those holes, there's little little um, circular spheres on here. There are three spheres, and those fit into those holes. And then there's levers, you see this lever right here, that tighten that down. So that would tighten this down. And then we would take a rod with a millimeter ruler on it, and we would measure for every single one of these. There's like, every, one, every hole had a letter on it, so it had an um, index, and it would write down how deep the rod went. So every time the patient got treated, we would verify that. So this was a bit this was a bit of a headache, <laughs> this thing, to make this thing. But that's all we had for, for a long time. It reproduced really well. Our numbers here were, were usually right on. And this is another version of a relocatable frame, the Latin frame. I never used that one. This is what we use today. This is an excellent frame. It reproduces really well. And we don't have to do this just because it's it's so um, uh, it's so customized. I mean, you can see that you can see that this the straps might give a little bit, and so there could be some uncertainty here. Uh, but with that one, there's the patients line up really well now. There's still, I mean, there's still uncertainty. We'll see, we'll see a difference between CT and treatment, you know, up to three or four millimeters. We'll see that. Okay, so that that difference does exist. But what we do when we see that is we take X-rays. When we were doing this, we weren't taking X-rays. We take x-rays to, to, um, to find the correct position of the patient. OK, sites. What do we treat with SRS? So we treat um, cranial. I'm, I'm only going to think this now. This talk is only about cranial radiosurgery. I don't think I have SBRT on here. So cranial radiosurgery, the malignant sites. The malignant, what do you guys think malignant means? What's your sense? It spreads. Yeah, it can spread. It can spread. It can grow. Um, it could. Usually something that grows or spreads is malignant. Okay, so 
uh, malignant, so metastases malignant. So metastases means that something's a tumor spread. Um, so metastases to the brain is our primary treatment site. Okay, so where do you get meds from? Primarily breast cancer, um, not, not breast cancer, breast cancer. I think lung cancer spreads to the brain. Certain cancers will go to the brain and will cause metastases. And um, there are, look how many new cases. There are a lot of new cases every year. Okay, so there's, unfortunately, there's a, a lot of cases of meds around. And then glioblastoma, that's another, that's another malignant tumor that we treat with SRS. Benign, benign tumors we treat, pituitary adenoma, acoustic neuroma, and meningioma, trigeminal neuralgia, arterial ABM. So there's a lot of benign stuff we treat too. And benign means, you're right, it's not going to spread and it's not going to keep growing. It's not going to, you know, if there's an acoustic neuroma, it's not going to grow into this huge tumor. It's just going to kind of sit there and disrupt the, the patient's hearing. Same thing for a trigeminal nerve. Um, that's the trigeminal neuralgia is when patients feel this excruciating pain in their fifth nerve. And patients have like, committed suicide because the pain is so bad. So there's different ways of treating trigeminal neuralgia. One of them is uh, radio surgery. Meningiomas also also occur in the brain. These are all well, these are all cranial. And then functional. We've never treated it. I've never been involved with any kind of treatment. But there's an obsessive compulsive disorder. People get treated with radio surgery for OCD, and also Parkinson's disease. Okay, a couple of uh, I think they I think they treat these diseases at the gamma ethyl accident. So what's SRS compared to a conventional? Basically, SRS means a high dose to a small volume and short number of fractions. Okay? And it's delivered over many beams to spread out the dose. So just let's look at some let's look at some parameters that are different. With conventional, the dose per fraction is 1.5 to 3 gray. Okay, with SRS, you probably start at 5 gray if you go to 90 gray. Most of them are in most of them are right, right around here, 16 to 20, maybe 25 gray, most of them, okay, most of the SRSs. These are extremes, fine. In the 90 gray, that's a trigeminal nerve. Okay, that's basically, you're not going to treat a mess with 90 gray. Uh, number of fractions, five to 15, uh, sorry, 15 to 50 fractions, SRS is one fraction. Okay. Now, stereotactic radiotherapy, SRT, SRT, um, you can go to five fractions here in the United States. You can go to five. They won't go above five in SRT because it's filling. If you go above five, you give somebody, if you decide that this, this guy's got a brain tumor and you want to fraction it over maybe eight fractions because five is, is too short, it's too much of a dose in a short time. When you give eight fractions, you will not be able to build the stereotactic um, billing code. They won't be allowed to do it. So the stereotactic billing code is up to five fractions and that's why that's why stereotactic is considered up to five. In Europe, they go up higher. They go to eight, they go to nine, and they don't have billing codes like we do, so they're open. They can do whatever they want. So a lot of a lot of what we do, unfortunately, is a rule by billing. So PTV margins, what kind of margins? So we know that uh, often, if we treat lung cancer, we'll do a one cm margin around the lung or one and a half. Uh, for SRS, the uh, margins typically are millimeter, okay? a millimeter, two millimeters, three millimeters. Delivery equipment accuracy. So conventional. You know, our tolerance is usual when we do QA, two millimeters is like what we keep saying, right? If I ask you guys, what's the tolerance when you say two millimeter, you're probably 8% right most of the time. So for SRS, it's less than a millimeter, okay, tolerances. Except lasers, remember TG142? Lasers, you're allowed to go, uh, I think it's, yeah, one millimeter is the accuracy for lasers. Okay, and now the stereotactic frame, and I brought one. Actually, this one here is in the picture. This is a stereotactic frame. So another, another distinction between stereotactic and conventional is this new coordinate system. We're going to create a new coordinate system that's more accurate and more reliable than the coordinate system that just comes from the CT scan. For conventional radiotherapy, when you CT a patient and you bring the CT scans in, they appear on the screen and you know you can put a point and it will give you an XYZ, okay, that's a coordinate system, and that comes from the CT scan. But Things can go wrong in the CT scanner. The couch can slip. Um, the geometric accuracy might not be correct in the in and out direction. So for stereotactic radio surgery, we we do uh, we, we use this frame to give us a little more a little more accuracy and to give us a new coordinate system. And the way this frame works, there's different versions of this. 
I'm going to call this the birth cage. This is the radionics brain. This goes on the patient. See, this is, by the way, this is not a relocatable brain. This is an invasive brain that you see here. It has carbon fiber posts and it has pins. Okay, and there's four pins. I used to, I used to help the neurosurgeon put this on, and it's, and he would, he would inject lidocaine to the four spots where the, where the pins are going to go. Have you been involved with that, John? No. No. Thank you. no. So he'd inject this lidocaine. The bubble would like stick up this far on the patient's skin. He'd have like, these four welts, and that wasn't the bad part. The bad part was then screwing these pins into that big welt, and they were, and they were tightening pretty tight. We had these wrenches, and we. We go in as tight until they come in contact with the skull. And so that's the purpose of that is to ensure uh, the integrity of the positioning of that frame to make sure it's in the same place. And then this goes on top of that. So this would go on the patient and see these little balls. Those fit in the holes of the frame and then they get locked down. Then this gets scanned. And as you see, there's, an, there's a straight bar and there's an angle bar. So as it gets scanned, this each slice has a unique, this, this um, rod is in a unique position uh, on the slice because as you as you move in this direction, this rod the position of this rod changes. So you'll see, you'll see a dot on the screen. I don't have an example of it, but you'll see a dot on the screen that corresponds to this rod. You just see a dot. You don't even see the whole rod on one slice. And as you go as you move through the slices, that dot will move from left to right because okay, it's at an angle. Then the software takes this information, looks for all those dots, and it creates its own coordinate system. And so you go from an XYZ dot-com coordinate system to a radionics coordinate system or brain lock coordinate system, whatever software you use. Okay? And that coordinate system is a little more reliable than, than the dot -com coordinate system. So this is the radionics frame, and this is the brain lock frame right here. You still see the, the rods right here. So are the rods water equivalent? No, the rods are... You can, these are carbon fiber rods, they still show up in CT because it's in air. So um, you still, there's still contrast between the carbon fiber rods and the air. Oh, like looking at it, I thought it was metal. I thought it makes like all kinds of artifacts. No, no it's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's carbon fiber. Uh, yeah. The rods in the brain lab, because they're embedded in plastic, uh, these are like high Z's, something like barium or calcium or something. And you, they show up pretty well too. Okay, so there's the rods. Okay, so now why SRS? What's the advantage of SRS? Why don't we just treat everything with conventional radiotherapy? Treat gliomas, treat the meds, just treat them 180 a day. What's the advantage of SRS? The advantage of SRS is the therapeutic ratio. We can kill more tumor cells by delivering a high dose in a short in a short time. Okay. So the tum tumor cells in a short time have no ability to, to perform repair. So if the tumor cells don't have the time to perform repair, more of them are going to die. With conventional radiotherapy, when you treat 180 day, you're killing tumor cells, but then some of them are regenerating and they're coming back and they're repairing. So with SRS, you're precluding them. You're not allowing them to, to repair. Okay, so that's fine, right? But the same thing happens to healthy cells. And what I mean by that is that these healthy cells don't have time to repair either. Okay, so we need to find an advantage there. We need to find um, an advantage to, to, to spare healthy tissue yet kill all the tumor cells. So healthy tissue must be avoided to a greater degree than with conventional RT. This is this is the advantage of radiosurgery that we're going to try to we're going to try to conform our isodose lines tighter around the tumor and and um, and um, push the isodose lines away from the healthy tissue. That's the advantage of, of radiosurgery. So how do we do that? How do we avoid healthy tissue? Wow, 42 slides. Okay. Uh, how do we avoid healthy tissue? We're gonna, you know, can you hit the lights, Jeff? Don? Yes. Is this, thanks. There's a, well, it's still a boring picture. Okay, so there's a picture of a, of a guy in an in a invasive head frame. You can see a post right here. And, uh, and his, he's on a head frame. He's on the couch. Okay, so this is the couch here. Up here, this is the this is the cone holder that's on the head of the linac. The linac's up here, pointing down towards the patient. And the cone is inside this, this there's a cylinder here. It's kind of like a housing for that cone. So the way that this cone fits on the linac, there's a, there's a metallic cylindrical housing. And you bring the linac down at a certain angle. This slides in kind of like a mortar shell. Okay. And it slides in. And then we put a ring on it. We tighten it up. And that's the ring that holds it in. Okay. 
And so that's just, that explains that picture. And this ring around the patient here, this is called an LTLF, LTLF um, frame, laser target localization frame, something like that. And the purpose of this frame is to align the lasers to, to the frame, so that the lasers are, um, are centered on the tumor. So how do we avoid healthy tissue? So this is the goal of radio surgery. We want to blast that tumor with a really high dose and avoid all the healthy tissue so that, uh, so that we're not concerned about damaging the healthy tissue as much as the tumor. So protection of brain tissue and other sensitive structures is achieved through small fields, sharp dose fall off, and precise patient positioning. These, are, these three aspects are aspects of radio surgery that are more enhanced in radio surgery than in 3D conformal. Okay, so in 3D conformal, these all exist, okay, except the small fields. We don't necessarily have to treat the small fields. But the sharp dose fall off, we try to ensure sharp dose fall off and precise patient positioning, but it's, it's to a higher degree in SRS. And then also we have a new coordinate system based on localized parents. Okay, okay, so again, avoiding healthy tissue, how, how, what's one way that we ensure accurate patient setup? The invasive head ring. Okay, so I talked about this, this is a better picture. These, these are um, carbon fiber pins. This tip right here is made of ceramic. This is the brain lab system. It's made of ceramic, um, and it's made of ceramic just so it doesn't create artifacts in CT. Uh, the radionics pins were made of metal. So, um, so this invasive head ring ensures that these pins go in here and they go into the patient's head. They, it ensures the patient, between CT and treatment, they're gonna, their head is going to be in the exact same, same spot. Okay. So that's one way we, we can ensure uh, patient's positioning. What about the LENAC? So say we ensure patient's positioning, but the LENAC's sloppy, or it's not centered, and it doesn't rotate around one axis, it kind of wobbles around. Well, we need to ensure that the LENAC is mechanically stable and mechanically solid and goes around a single axis. And we do that by the winston lutz test. Who's done a winston lutz test? Conscience, put your hand up. You did one, didn't you? Uh, different devices. No, you didn't do a winston lutz with me? Um, Maybe not. I'm going to think of Stephanie. Anyway, well, I'll, I'll explain what the winston lutz test. The winston lutz test is um let's bring the other slides up this is a this is a picture of the couch and you'll place a bb on the end of the couch and then uh, you'll align the bb to your lasers okay as accurately as possible and these bbs usually have some markings some crosshairs on them they're really small and you can align your really your uh, radio surgery lasers to those very very accurately then once you align that you, you use a, a film holder that's attached to the head of the machine and you you place a film behind the bb and then you put a cone up in the head of the machine. So there's a cone up here. Okay, there's a cone up here, and then you irradiate the BB. And what you're going to see is this. So this is what the film looks like. Now, why are there multiple shots? Because each shot corresponds to uh, a gantry angle and a couch angle. And we're missing actually we're missing one here, 180. It's, it's not on this picture. Okay, so there should be a 180, 270, 0, 90. And then this is the couch, 270. And the couch is here, and gantry equals zero degrees okay. for those for those couch angles. So we look at those shots, and those shots tell us about the isocentricity of the of the lineage. Okay, that looks pretty good actually. So that looks like a 270, pretty pretty centered zero looks good. Which one looks the worst? Probably this couch 270. And so couches are usually are usually not going to be as good. The shots are not going to be as as good as the gantries. Now, what if let's do a little ex thought experiment here? What if what if this ball is too high? What if it's up here? Well, it's an exaggeration. Okay, so it's it's up here on the 270, and it is <clears throat> it is up here on the 90. What does that indicate? What would you say? How would you fix that? Think in 3D what's happening. And in the direction, the gantry's up here, the gantry's in that direction. When you're shooting the film. Okay. So you're shooting, the gantry's shooting this way. Okay. Shooting this way at 270. What would that indicate? And how would you fix that? So 
Will it be the gantry sagging? Mm, not sagging. There is a. There, I'll show you what gantry sagging is in a minute, but it's not that one. It's not the gantry sagging. I think that these are these are lateral shots. Okay, so these are lateral shots, and the BB. And if you're looking at laterally, the BB is too far towards the gantry. Okay. And by the way, you'd probably see the zero look like that too. So the BB is too far towards the gantry compared to the radiation field defined by the cone. What do you think? What do you think that would indicate? It could be a couple of things. I don't know. Before I was trying to figure out well how that would be that 279 you were getting rid of zero for right. At zero you'd see the same thing. Could it have something to do with the position of the cone? Yes, no? Any guesses? I'll take guesses. in all three, it seemed like it could be the cone. Okay, yeah, it could be the cone. So what if you put the cone in, and depending on how your cone goes in, certain systems have certain ways of doing it. With the varying cones, it's a cone holder that slides into the wedge slot, okay? And, it, and then you tighten down these, these knobs and push against the machine. What if you didn't slide it in all of it? Okay, you would see something like that. Or actually, if you didn't slide it in all the way, um, yeah, you'd, you'd see something like that because the radiation field would be, well, the cone would be um, further towards the couch, which is the couch is that way. Gantry is this way, the couch is that way. So the radiation field would be towards the couch because you haven't pushed it in all the way. Okay, so that's one possibility. What's another possibility? Remember, you've used the lasers to line up this BB, okay? All right, so the other possibility is you push the cone in all the way, it's in the right spot, but your lasers are off. Okay, something happened, housekeeping went in, both, both lasers, and, uh, or somebody adjusted the lasers incorrectly. Okay? And you've, so now you've used the lasers which are adjusted incorrectly. You, the vertical laser uh, is moved too far towards the gantry, and therefore you've adjusted your ball towards the, to that laser. Now your ball is, is, looks like that. Okay? So, so this test will tell you that your lasers aren't aligned correctly. Okay, so let's look at another situation. Okay, so those, so that situation, cones are off and lasers are off. So another situation looks like this. Okay, this one and now here's the 180. Okay, so assume that this is the radiation field. On um, the zero, it's high. On the 80, it's low. How would that indicate? That's gantry setting. That's what you'd see in gantry setting. Now, gantry say, the gantry, when it rotates around, it's not a perfect, I mean, the thing weighs tons. So, at this position, the gantry actually tips forward a little bit, and in the, in the PA position, it tilts backwards a little bit. Okay. So, that gantry tag is going to show up. You're always going to have gantry setting. Like it's rare that I haven't seen a line that doesn't show up any kind of gantry setting. Usually, gantry sag is in the order of the total gantry sag, meaning the distance between here and here plus here and here is in the order of around 0 0.8 millimeters. This is, this is what I've seen, okay? Now, how do you get around that? You get around that by splitting the difference. When you shoot it, you make the 0 degree 0.4 millimeters off, and then you make the 180 degree 0.4 millimeters off. So in each direction, you're splitting the difference. How do you do that? By adjusting your lasers back and forth. Okay. So you take your shot, if, if this 180 is perfect, and it's right on here, and this is 8 millimeters off, then I would adjust my lasers back a little bit. I would adjust them back 0.4 millimeters. It's hard to do, but I, I could do it. And I'd adjust them back, and so then this, this would end up as being 0.4 in one direction and 0.4 in the other direction. Okay, that's how you split the difference of gantry sets. So would you have to make that same adjustment when you treated a patient at 0 or 180? No, because you've already adjusted your lasers to account for that. And the patient is set up to the lasers. You know? Does that make sense? Yeah. Because the patient is going to go where the lasers are, and you just adjusted them. Okay? Um, 
what about, I mean, another, another situation is, to the right here and the boss to the left here. You're off left, right. Um, no, if you're off left, right, you'd see that on the zero or the 180. Horizontal laser is too high. Okay, so you've just adjusted your beep. You've just adjusted. You set up your BB to this laser, which is too high, and you come around. You shot a one, and you shot a two seventy, and the BB looks like it's up here. This is a, remember this is a side view. Okay, so the BB looks like it's here, but when you come around to the other side, it looks like it's on the other side because it's it's opposite. Okay. So by looking at the Winston Lutz test and looking at the position of these balls, it tells you a lot about positional lasers. And it tells you it tells you something about gantry sag. And also, I mean, it could tell you if the gantry is sagging in the lateral position as well. Okay. If they're if they're if they're both sagging in this direction, then it looks like the BB is too high. Okay. So um, anyway, that test that test tells us a lot about uh, the, the integrity. And by the way, the the spec for the spec for um, Winston Lutz test is the the brain lab spec is less than 0 0.7 millimeters uh, in any of these shots, and that's that's the distance from the center the center of this BB to the center of the radiation field. That's the spec, and we're pretty we're usually pretty good. Now, what if uh, so? That's less than 0 0.7. Uh, and then what if at, at our baseline value, when we're accepting the machine, we get 0 0.5 as our maximum deviation? And we do the Winston Lutz test before every patient's treated. So what if we get, what if we get uh, 0 0.8 on one of these? What do you think we do? And we adjusted the lasers, and we did everything we could, but we still get 0 0.8. Do we treat the patient? 0 0.8 is within 0 0.7 of 0 0.5, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if you added that 0.7 tolerance to your baseline? Oh no, the, the brain lab spec, they ensure that their <clears throat> linear accelerator, say it's in a balance machine, they ensure that their linear balance machine is going to be better than 0.7 millimeters on all these shots. That's, this, that's like their spec. It's not the plus or minus 0.7. Okay. It's less than 0.7. Okay, so, and we get, we, we get lucky. When we accept it, we get 0.5. What happens if we get 0.8 when we do once and less? Do we treat the patient? Well, remember, anytime you, you have a spec, uh, this is a manufacturer spec, that's great. You were able to get 0.5, so this is the capability of your machine. You always have to give yourself a margin, plus or minus something. And so a, a pretty good margin on, on this kind of thing is plus or minus 0 0.5, maybe even more, maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.6 millimeters. Okay, so that, that can take you 
but that can take you up to one millimeter. So if you, I would say that if you're beyond one millimeter, you really should consider not treating the patient and investigating. But if we're if you're within a millimeter, you're probably okay. Maybe you're just having a bad day. And you're, not, you're not aligning stuff properly. Okay? Does all that make sense? Treatment planning beam data challenges. All right, so what about beam data, the beam data that we collect? Is it different than, than con conventional beam data? Absolutely, it's totally different. The, what we collect is pretty similar in terms of the PDDs and profiles. So we do collect PDDs and we collect profiles, but it's the way that we collect them and the care and uh, the, the, um, the accuracy which, which we, we collect them that's important. Usually, if you're gonna collect PDDs for radio surgery beams, Remember what I said that radius surgery cones go from five centimeters down to four millimeters? Imagine putting a farmer chamber in a four millimeter cone. <laughs> and the farmer chamber is five times bigger than this thing. So you know, you know, the uh, the, uh, the ionization chamber that you pick and the detector that you pick has a great effect on the PDs. Most chambers are too big to scan these these little cones, and the smallest chambers suffer from noise. So they make micro chambers that are teeny tiny but they're very high in noise. Okay, so when you scan a PDD, you'll, it'll be a really noisy PDD just because the signal that you're collecting is in a very small volume. And so you're not creating any. Remember how ion chambers work? You create, you're creating ion pairs inside the air. Well, if the volume's really small, you're not creating that many ion pairs. And therefore, your, your signal is small. I for, huh? Yeah. Could you <laughs> slow down, as you take your PDD, slow down the uh, and take, you know, rather than two minutes for a PDD, you take 10 or 15. Absolutely, that's a great technique. Okay, that's a great technique. And what I've done in the past, not just slowed it down, I've made it go to points. I've made it go to a certain point and collect 30 data points at one point. And then once that's collected, I go to the next point, a millimeter down, collect 30 data points, and average over 30. That's really the only way for these tiny cones, that's really the only way that you're going to be able to get clean data. Okay. And you know, you take, you just have this chamber sit there while you radiate it, and you average over 30, 50 points, whatever it takes. And you average over that many points. Uh, it takes a really long time, but you get, you get your data, you get, you get clean data. So, uh, what, what a lot of people do, and what, what our recommendation is, is to use the, the stair technique field diode. Okay. And uh, there are different, there are different versions of this. The SFD is made by. Um, is made by Wellhopper, but the other companies make diode detectors. Um, I think some nuclear makes one called the, the edge detector, and it's, it's just a diode. And the advantage of a diode is that the measurement point is so tiny that it's really small. Uh, and not only is it really small, so it, it defines a very small point in, in the water, uh, it also has a very high signal-to-noise ratio. Because now you're not collecting ions in air, you're collecting uh, ions in silicon. Okay, so this, it's a lot more dense, so radiation creates a lot more ions because there's, there's more material there for radiation to interact with. But there are issues with this. I had so many issues with the Wellhopper SFD uh, because it's dose rate dependent. It starts to, the response of it starts to change over time. And I didn't know this. I thought, hey, you know, this thing is it's recommended to, that I use this. So I started using it. And my PDDs would look differently when I would shoot one and then I would shoot another one, and they would look differently. And so I realized that it had a dose rate dependence and it had a, a drift. And so I had to take that out. What I noticed is if I irradiated it for a certain time, I would be okay. And if I kept irradiating it, it would drift. But if I stopped and let it relax and pause, it would go back to its initial state. So I had to irradiate, use it, scan a PDD, and then let it rest for like five minutes and to go back and read it. So you come up with these techniques, uh, and that wasn't documented anywhere. And in fact, I, I called Wellhopper and I told them about it, and they just kept sending me new diodes. So I have like five diodes at, at uh, Evanston because uh, just, I've been just collecting them over time because uh, they kept sending me diodes to try different diodes. But it's not the diode, it's really the way the diode uh, works. So really, this is the take-home message about this is really understand how your detector works. Um, another another property about detectors is let's see, do I have anything about the microchamber here? Another chamber we use is a microchamber. Okay, and one of the microchambers that I've used is the Xradin A16. Xradin, you've heard of Xradin? Okay, Xradin. 
A16. Now the A16, um, its signal to noise ratio is not bad, but it's heavily dependent on polarity. So if you if you measure it with one polarity and then you flip it and you measure the PV with another polarity, the curve's going to look different and the signal's going to be different. So you, with the extra A16, you always have to take measurements at, at both polarities. Okay, so that doubles your your data taking time. Okay. Major challenge, aligning the detector to the small field is very difficult. Imagine a four millimeter cone. If you're gonna to try to align the detector to that light field, you could hardly see the light field. It looks like a little pinpoint. Okay, so aligning the detector to that is very difficult and it's very technique based. And usually, I mean, you'll try to align it visually as best you can, and then you'll just scan the detector up and down to see if, if it tracks and you watch the light field. The other thing you can do is scan across it to make sure that you're in the center of the profile. So there's several techniques you could use. Uh, profile measurements are done with film typically to achieve acceptable resolution and avoid chamber averaging effects in the penumbra. So for, film is probably the best for, for measuring profiles for stereotactic, for stereotactic beams, uh, GIF chromic film. Output factors are measured for microchamber for small fields, with microchamber for small fields. So these are the recommendations, and there's there are uh, TG protocols out there uh, that recommend these. Okay, now sources of geometric uncertainty. So we're going through all the uncertainties now. So sources of geometric uncertainties, where are these uncertainties? It's our job to know where these uncertainties are and to test them so that um, we can minimize them. So number one, Linux, Linux accuracy, and we just talked about the Winston Lutz test. This is another one, flame, frame flex after setup. All right, now flake, frame flex is to the patients in their frame and you put them down on the table you bolt them down to the table. There, and if you ask the patient to try to move, they'll be able to flex that frame. Okay. Imagine this is, you know, especially heavier patients that have strong necks, they can easily flex that frame. Okay. And that's a problem because if they're flexing the frame while they're getting irradiated, their tumor is moving. So there's not much you could do about frame flex except tell the patient to hold as still as possible. Okay. That's number one. Uh, the frame flex also between different manufacturers is different. Like the gamma, the gamma night frame is extremely strong. Okay? So there's not much frame flex. But usually linear accelerator based frames are, um, are not as strong. So this is just something to, to just let the patient know not to, not to move. Uh, CT slice thickness and pixel size. If you're going to scan a patient with a thick slice, obviously you're, you're decreasing your accuracy in the head to foot direction. Okay? So, with radius surgery, we tend to scan our patients with um, 1.6 to 1 millimeter um, slice thickness. MRI distortion. Well, we often use MRIs to, to help us locate tumors in the brain because MRIs give us more soft tissue contrast and we can see tumors better. But the disadvantage of MRI is distortion. And where does the distortion come from? Magnetic field. So MRI, are you guys learning about MRI yet? In any of your courses? I can talk about it again. You want to talk about it? Well, uh, the way MRI works is very strong magnetic fields um, permeate the head, and then the um, the relaxation of the atoms, um, the different the different types of the different amount of relaxation of the atoms correspond to different types of tissues, and that's how the MRI image is formed. But it's uh, the Geometric, the geometric accuracy of MRI is not as good as CT because it really depends on the uniformity of the magnetic field. And, the, and it's not that uniform in some cases, depending, depending on how, depending where you're imaging and how you image it. So, um, so that's primarily that's why we use CT when we do when we use radio surgery because what we do is we we scan the CT and then we scan the MRI and the software has. Usually, SRS software has uh, fusion capabilities. And have you guys done fusion before? Anybody here done fusion? Done fusion. Done. Yeah. With what system do they have it with? I did it in an Eclipse. Oh, okay. So. And there's different kinds of fusion. There's fusion that just takes into account translational and rotational, the six degrees of freedom. And other fusion softwares will do um, work. Okay, so they'll work the image. And so they'll actually bend certain parts of the image into the CT image set. The uh, radionic system uses warp and brain lab doesn't work and uh, Eclipse doesn't work either. But some of the some of the newer I think Nimvista might do you have Nimvista Luther? No. Yeah, 
I can't remember. Anyway, some of the newer softwares uh, do do more of it. And then there are system specific issues. Now every system has their has their deficiencies. And here's and just to give you an example, here's a problem. Oh, I'm not going to call it a problem. <coughs> Bless you. I'm not going to call it. But here's an issue that I I find is an issue with Braille Lab, but this is how the system works. Uh, to align the patient uh, in the treatment room, this this metal box that goes over the patient's brain that locks down, and then these pieces of paper are printed from the treatment planning computer, and the uh, they're printed with see this outline right here. That's an outline of the field, and the isocenter is right here. And so you place that paper on this box, and then you align the lasers to that isocenter. Okay, where do you think the where do you think is the source of error? Printing. Printing, correct. The software actually allows you to print a, um, a calibration sheet with, with millimeter markings. So you could print it and then you could check with the ruler to make sure that all millimeter markings are linear. Okay. So you could check the calibration of the printer. What else is a source of uncertainty? Physical alignment. Correct. That's that's the issue I have with this system. Uh, the alignment you see, there's millimeter markings here, and there are millimeter markings on the box itself. But how good you align those, it, that's that's really going to depend. That's that's going to affect the patient's treatment. How well you're aligning those millimeter markings. Uh, so, you know, usually depends depends on the depends where you work. Some places the physicist will align this. Some places the therapist will align it. Uh, and you definitely want somebody to double check the line. But that that is, is a crucial step in um, in this system. And I'm, I'm not that crazy about this system. Because it opens it opens it up for inaccuracies. Now this is just for the frame invasive frame based, okay? Uh, and and I'll talk about the image guided greater surgery in a minute. But that's just that's without image guidance. That's just uh, frame based. Okay, another issue for equipment QA. So make sure that you're doing your QA program includes some way of uh, detecting issues with the QA with the equipment. Here's one issue that we had. This is me holding the invasive frame, and we noticed there was a crack in it. As the doctor was screwing these pins in, they heard a crack. And the doctor said, whoops. So they took it off, and then they gave it to me, and I looked at it, and I found this crack right here. So why is there a crack in it? Why were we using a frame that cracks? Well, we were using, we were using that because those carbon fiber posts were used many, many times, and they actually have a lifetime. Um, and we weren't aware that they had a lifetime. We thought that we could use them forever. So when I called the manufacturer, they said, no, no, you, you should only use those after uh, for this many uh, this many treatments and this many uh, sterilizations because sterilization also um, weakens the material so uh, that shouldn't have happened but uh, but anyway it's not a big deal the patient didn't get hurt we just used new posts okay so that's an example of uh, equipment faults avoiding healthy tissue so the other the other way that we avoid healthy tissue in radio surgery is by arcing making arms, right? So if we deliver one single beam, we're going to say you're delivering 90 degrees to the trigeminal nerve, everything in that one column is getting irradiated. But if you're able to arc around a, a focus point, then you can spread that radiation out, and but, but the point, the tumor or the nerve or whatever is at, at the, at the um, axis of rotation gets all the dose, okay? and everything else is spread out. So this is just an example of, you know, of arc spreading around and they're all focused in one spot in the middle where the tumor will be. So the delivery of radiation through the use of multiple arcs spreads out the dose throughout the healthy brain but focuses it at the actual center where the tumor is located. Isodose lines can be shaped by varying the arc length and modifying the weight of each beam. The same code size is usually used for each arc. Okay. So by, by spreading out the dose like this, if, if they all have the same weight, the isodose distribution is going to look pretty spherical. But say your tumor is not spherical. What you could do is, if the tumor is elongated in this direction, exaggerate, exaggerated tumor, um, I can weight this beam and make this beam deliver much more amuse than these other beams. And if that happens, that'll pull the isodosis in this axis. Okay, so that's one technique of uh, bell shape. If I want to, if I want to pull it in this in this direction, if the tumor is elongated in this direction. What I could do is I could cut this beam, so we're not treating in this in this sector, we're not treating this, and weight this one and this one heavily, and these not so heavily. 
metal codes and metal code bases are just in that direction. Okay, so those are just techniques in terms of shaping uh, shaping the beam. Okay. All right, let's take a break and then we'll talk a little bit into the limitations of SRS.
I've been walking by these and this hallway down, walking down the hallway here. People sleep on the couches. They're like sprawled out like the bits of their beds. It's funny. Mm -hmm. It's a great place to take a nap. It's a nice view. Yeah, I think the med students have some tests this week. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, can you get the lights again now? Limitations of SRS. All right, well, what are the limitations? So the number one, the number one limitation, large tumors. Okay, so you get to a point where the tumor gets so large, and, and you want to give, you still want to give a, a single shot, a very high dose, but the tumor is so large that you're coming in, you're arcing, etc. You're doing all the all the arcs and spreading out the dose, but still look at your isodose lines. They're still they, they become really large, etc. Themselves because the tumor is large. So the path that the radiation is traveling to cover this. So imagine if you're coming in from the side to cover this tumor, you need a large cone or a large field. And so you're, you're treating a large area out here. You're treating a lot more area here. And then you're coming from this side. So you're coming from this side to treat this. So you're treating all this volume here. And what's happening is that your isodose lines become large and your, uh, your prescription line becomes large. And you might be able to conform your prescription line around your tumor, but your 80%, 70% isodose lines aren't going to be larger than you want them to be. Okay, 80% of a prescription that's 20 gray, it's still, I mean, it's still 16 gray. It's a, big, it's a big dose over a big volume. And what happens is that you start to see more side effects. You start to treat more healthy tissue and you see more side effects. So there's a limit to the size of the tumor that you can treat with SRS. Okay? Typical limits are, I don't have the number in here, but our limit, the limit at Evanston is 3.5 cm diameter. That's our limit. And that just comes from the literature. I mean, it comes from experience. It comes from uh, side effects. So anything bigger than that, we just shy away from uh, for SRS. Once they get bigger than that, then we start thinking about fractionation. So that's one limitation of SRS, tumor size. Uh, another limitation, these are the big two really, this one and this one. Another limitation is tumors located near critical organs. This does not need to be a big tumor. This could be a small tumor that's located near a critical organ. A critical organ can be, well, what's in the head? You guys have taken anatomy. What are the critical organs in the head? Brainstem. Brainstem, yes. Eye. I'll be with eye. What is it? Uh, optico chiasma. Optic chiasm, optic pathway, right? Because there's a chiasm, and what else is there? The nerves. Nerves and? Eyeball. Tracks. So nerves and tracks. So there's the, the nerves go from the eyeball to the optic chiasm, and the tracks go back towards the brain. So that whole optic apparatus, yeah. Um, eyes, yeah, eyes. Lenses. Lenses. Brides. Brides, yeah. I mean, they're a little lower down. Usually not, they're not in the way of a... Uh, Okay. Then there's other things like um, motor strips. There's like we try to stay away from motor strips. Um, so there's some areas that sometimes I, I have never even heard of. It, the neurosurgeon said try to stay away from this. This is this area. I said okay, and I'll contour it and we'll try to stay away from it. So anyway, there are critical structures in the brain. And um, so any tumor, any size that's located really close to a critical structure, we have to limit the dose to that critical structure. And at times it's so close that we can't fully treat the tumor uh, without damaging the optic pathway, or brain stem, or whatever. Okay, in those situations, again, we're limited okay, with SRS. So those are the big two. The big tumors and the tumors close to um, critical structures. Those are, gonna, those are gonna limit our dose. And maybe even, um, maybe even it, it would um, exclude this patient from any surgery in some cases, because they produce unacceptable side effects. So those are the big two. Correction issues. So what do we do about those? What do we do about cases where we want to give a single shot, but it's too close to the, to the uh, brain stem or optic, optic pathway, or it's too large? We, we fractionate. Okay. Now, we're, we're going we're gonna to fractionate, but we're still going to do stereotactic fractionation. So we're still going to use the head frame. We're going to use everything we, we're, we're used to using for radio surgery, but we're going to spread it over a certain number of fractions. How many fractions? Typically, it's five. Okay. At times, we've done three, but typically, it's five. So, what do we do for fractionated? So now we're changing gears here. We're talking about fractionated. We're not going to use the invasive head ring, right? Why not? We all love the invasive head ring because it's so reproducible. 
patients don't want to go. We love it because you know we know the patient's going to go in the right spot. But we can't use it now. Why? Imagine putting this thing, this invasive heparin on five times. <laughs> the patient would leave. Okay. Um, or what we did it. This is back in. We'll give you a little history story. Back when I was in my master's degree, back 19, 1989, 1990, where I was where I was being trained, they were doing a lot of radio surgery. Um, and they call it the McGill method. And the way the McGill method worked is the patient would lie down on the couch, and the linear channel would, would start at a certain point. And then when the beam came on, the couch and the gantry would move at the same time. And that was that was their own method. And they came up with all the treatment planning parameters for that, and and they treated the patients for that. So the advantage of that is that you're spreading you're spreading the dose over the entire head, okay, evenly, and it traced the baseball stitch over the head. That's the the path that it took. Uh, so that was their method, and what they did is they put the patient in an invasive head ring, and they would send them home when they would fractionate. So they'd go home with this head ring. Of course, they'd give special instructions not to, you know, not to play football and things like that, and to be very careful with the head ring. But back then, we didn't have relocatable head rings, and that's what they did. So today we do, and we, we trust them. So uh, another another aspect of SRT: the margins on the tumor are larger in SRT than SRS. Why would that be? Why are we going to do that? That's not a good thing, is it? You're positioning them more than once. Yeah. You're introducing error more than once. Right. Your error positioning has now gone up, so we need to account for that with margins. And we don't want to, but we have no choice because we might miss the tumor if we don't do that. Okay. Multiple fractions in SFT spares late responding tissues, such as healthy tissue. Okay. So with with multiple fractions, and I'll show you the radio biology curve in a second. It spares. Healthy tissue is considered late responding tissue. It's a tissue that, uh, after you irradiate it, it won't show up side effects right away, but it'll take a little while to, to respond. That's what late responding means. And healthy tissue is one example of the late responding tissue. So now it's, this, I'll, this will be clear in a, in a minute. More beneficial to treat tumors that are near healthy tissue with SRT instead of SRS since it allows a healthy tissue to recover. Okay, so remember what fractionation does. It allows the tissue to recover. So if you've got a tumor really close to the optic pathway, and you hit it with a certain amount of dose, and then you give it some time, it'll recover, and the, the likelihood of damaging that tissue over multiple fractions is lower. Of course, if you're gonna treat multiple fractions, you're not gonna treat the same dose as a single fraction, right? Example, 20, you might treat 20 gray with SRS in one shot, but if you're gonna fractionate it, this might become five gray times five. Okay, just an example, okay? So at five gray, the healthy tissue will not be as, the, the damages will not be as great as 20 gray. Okay, so that's the advantage, and they'll be able to recover. Um, look at the total dose here. It's higher, right? Five times five. So the total dose with fractionated is usually is always higher than single shot. Okay, so you could give a higher total dose. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Down here, tumor size now, now um, tumor size limit of SRS less than three or three and a half is no longer there. We could treat higher to we'll get you to higher sizes uh, and then then this last point what this means is that we have some uncertainty on what our tolerance doses are for SRT for SRS we've been doing it for so many years we know what the brainstem can take in one shot we know what the optic apparatus can take in one shot we know that if we pass a certain dose level we're going to start seeing side effects but SRT it's not that it's not as clear we don't have that much experience so we still, we're, we're very conservative on our tolerance doses. And I've sent you guys tolerance doses right in the past. Those are, those are always, those are called unverified tolerance doses. Those are tolerance doses that come from different studies, but they're not studies that the study particularly side effects. Because imagine, how would you do a study on side effects? You're going to take volunteers and they're going to say, we're going to radiate you guys to 10 grade, we're going to radiate you guys to 15, and, then, and we're going to look at That doesn't exist. Okay? You can't do that. You can't hurt people like that. So all the studies come from um, anecdotal follow-ups on patients' side effects. So they're not very controlled. Yeah, so, um, so basically the data is scattered and not that reliable. So we're still very conservative about SRT um, tolerance doses. All right, so here's the radiobiology curve. You guys are gonna, you guys are gonna um, do tons of radiobiology next quarter. But this is a, this is a cell survival curve. And so the abscissa here, the x-axis is dose, the surviving fraction is uh, on the y-axis, and what you're seeing here is 
this graph, this dotted line, oh, sorry, let's look at graph A first. Graph A is a single shot of a dose, okay? So if you give if you give the tumor this much dose, then the surviving fraction is going to be this much. If you give the tumor this much dose, surviving fraction is that. As you can see, the dose goes up, the surviving fraction drops, right? The number of cells that you kill increases. The number of surviving cells decreases, okay? So that's pretty clear. What's interesting about the self-survival curve is that there's a, they call this the linear quadratic model. So it's linear at first, and then it does a quadratic. So it kind of bends down. So this little, see how the curve is curved here, and then um, it's linear down here. What happens is that if you fractionate, you can take advantage of that. So if you give one shot, it'll look like this. Then you give another shot, it'll see this bump right here. What happens is that the resultant curve is above the single shot curve. Okay. So what that means is that for a single shot, if you deliver this much dose in one shot, you'll have a surviving fraction of this much. But if you fractionate it, your surviving fraction will be higher. Okay. So if you fractionate something, and this is what I've been saying, cells recover. The recovery, the recovery part portion is right here, right at the beginning. Okay. So if you're able to fractionate, your surviving fraction is higher. So that's how fractionation works. Okay, um, let's see, do I have another, I don't know, no. Okay, um, yeah. So let's see what the, let's see what the caption says. Idealized fractionation experiment. Curve A is a survival curve for single acute exposure of x-rays. Curve F is obtained if each dose is given as a series of small fractions of size D, uh, D1, with an interval between fractions sufficient for repair of sublethal damage uh, to take place. Sublethal damage? is damage that it occurs, but that can be repaired. To take place, multiple small fractions approximate to a continuous exposure uh, to a low dose rate. Okay, so, so here's a, so there's many, there's many models. Here's a, here's a cell where radiation comes in and affects the DNA, and that cell just dies because there's enough radiation in there to, to kill, to affect the DNA so that it can't, it can't divide any longer, and it just dies. So that's one the one method. Uh, so this is like instant death of the cell. Okay, and the other one is apoptosis. There's the radiation comes in and the cell is slightly damaged, but it's not sure uh, what it's going to do with itself and it kills itself. You know, apoptosis is self kill. Okay, so it kills itself. Uh, another one is sublethal, where there is some damage to the DNA. So the DNA is damaged, but it the DNA can, can repair itself. Okay? So it repairs itself, and then it goes on to be a viable cell, and it goes on to, to then multiply after that. Okay? So those are kind of those are the three basic uh, ways that cells can either die or, or uh, live on. So this is sublethal repair. So, and then there's cells that don't even get irradiated. Okay? So those are cells that don't even get hit. Those are those obviously live. Okay. Okay, so dose levels for fractionated treatments. So most of the tumor response is for single fraction, as I said before. If the doctor wants to fractionate, dose dose needs to be divided rated biologically. In other words, if we have data for it, from it, for um, control of metastases, then we know that 20 gray, gray is going to control metastases. Let's say the tumor is big and we want to fractionate. How much dose are we going to get now? Well, we use rated biological models to come up with that. One of them is the linear quadratic model. So we use that to calculate dose per fraction to achieve the same response as a single fraction. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna find an equivalent dose for multiple fractions that's gonna equivalent that's gonna be equivalent to the cell response of a single fraction. We're gonna use this term called alpha over beta. Have you guys heard of that? Alpha beta ratio. That's a rate of you'll hear, you'll hear that a lot in radiobiology. It's a radio radiobiological dose parameter. And the way the Kind of the take-home message is early reacting tissues such as skin, uh, intestinal epithelial, and tumors. So those are those are tissues that respond right away. If you irradiate a tumor right away, it'll start shrinking. Like you know, if you irradiate lung tumors, after a couple of weeks, they'll start shrinking right away. So they have an instant response. Skin, if you irradiate it, what happens when you're in the sun? It gets red. Okay, so there's an instant response. Certain tissues respond respond very quickly. They have a they have an alpha beta ratio of 10 gray. Okay, so that's the typical number that we give alpha beta for early responding tissues, early reacting tissues. 
late reacting tissues such as brain tissue, bone, um, and we're starting to see prostate. Prostate looks like this too. So bone and brain tissue have a ratio of two to three gram, okay, for alpha, alpha over beta ratio. The alpha over beta ratio is derived from cell survival curves or in vivo data. So this comes from um, data that comes from cell survival curves. Well, okay, so how do we use this? How do we use this mathematically? How do we how do we come up with equivalent doses? So uh, the BED is a biological equivalent dose. Okay, so we're going to account for um, how quickly a tissue responds, how effective a certain type of radiation uh, regimen is. We're going to do this with the BED. So BED is equal to N, which is the number of fractions. D is the dose per fraction. And, and so here's an example. So, and then alpha-beta ratio is what we just talked about, the 10 gray or the 2 gray or the 3 gray. So let's let's see how we're going to use this in a problem. So example, SRS fraction is 15 gray. A single a single dose is 15 gray. Now the question is, what dose per fraction do we need to give in two fractions? Say we want to fractionate this in two fractions, not five, just two as an example, to achieve the same biological tumor response um, as a single shot of 15 gray. Okay, and remember, tumor is alpha beta equals 10. So here's how we do it. Single shot biological equivalent dose is equal to n, number of fractions is 1, but 15 gray, and then 1 plus dose is 15, and alpha beta is 10. Okay? So that turns out to be the biological equivalent dose of that treatment is 37.5 gray. Okay? Intuitively, I mean, that doesn't really make sense intuitively, but we're going to use this for comparative purposes only. So, now, we want to treat with two fractions of SRT, and we want to know how much dose per fraction we want to give to get the same biological response. And so we do this by using the equation again. Okay, so now n is 2, d is our d is our unknown. That's what we want to find. d is up here, and then alpha beta is 2, because again, we want to know what the dose, we want to know the tumor response. Okay, so if we solve for these, if we solve for this equation, we get uh, a dose of 9.6 gray per fraction for two fractions. Okay, so again, 9.6 times 2 is 19.2. Okay, it's higher than the original. Remember how it, usually the fraction it goes to a higher total dose, but this the per dose fraction is the same is is lower than the single fraction. Okay, so if you deliver 15 gray, and then you deliver two times 9.6 gray, you're going to get the same rate of biological response. Okay. Isn't that amazing how this simple equation could come up with that? Well, it's not very accurate. Okay, it's all okay. okay, so it's not completely accurate. And you know, we're humans. People respond different. But it's all we have right now, and that's what that's where that's where our, um, uh, we actually use this to come up with fractionation schemes. So this is one method that we use. Another method that we use to come up with fractionation schemes are protocols. Have you guys heard of protocols? Somebody will set up a protocol and say, well. We're going to try to treat this metastases with five fractions, and we're going to do it, you know, maybe maybe if you do a METS with five fractions, you'll get something like, I don't know, seven grade per fraction, just using this equation. But the protocol says, well, we think that's too conservative. We're going to go 10 grade per fraction. So if somebody can set up a protocol that comes up with some fractionation scheme, and then they'll put patients on the protocol, and then follow, treat the patients and follow them afterwards and see what their response is. And that's another way. To create to come up with fractionation schemes, that's more clinical. All right now, how would you solve this? Um, this looks like a, let's see d. So if you multiply d in there, you get d plus d squared over ten. And it becomes a quadratic equation, doesn't it? So you end up with a quadratic equation. So you use the quadratic formula to solve it. You usually end up with two roots. Okay, one root that doesn't make any sense. It's negative or something. Okay, so usually one root you can. You can cancel out of there. Okay, what about OER? So that was tumor. That's that's biological equivalent dose of tumors. And by the way, BED is used in, in a lot of other areas. Um, it's common to use BED and and um, HDR. Okay, so say you treat a patient with 4,800. You guys have all done HDR. We kind of know what it's about, right? Some patients that are treated with HDR get external beam as well. They'll get 4,500 like sick gynecological. They'll get 4,500 to the pelvis. And then they get HDR, and the doctor will prescribe I don't know, two. Uh, what's a typical HDR dose of like seven times, maybe seven times two, two thousand with two thousand centigrade with HDR, 
plus 4,500. Can you add them up and say the patient died a total dose of 7,000 gray, 8,000 gray, 8,000 centigrade? You can't add them, right? Because there's gray biological issues here. So a common common use of the D is to come up with the biological equivalent dose of the 4,500 centigrade and the HDR. Okay? And you use these formulas. Kind of, there's a modification that you have to. But there's one more step you have to do for that kind of equivalence. You make them both equivalent to uh, 200 centigrade per day. You make the HDR 200 centigrade per day, and you make the 4,500, and then you can add them up. Okay, so, so you'll see this a lot in, in the clinic. Being used in the clinic. All right, so what do you what do you do about OER? So this equation can also be used to determine the OER tolerance dose. So say you're treating um, prescription doses 50 gray and two gray times 25 fractions. This looks pretty typical for maybe a brain tumor that's fractured. Not, not an SRS, just a typical fractionary brain tumor. The optic nerve cannot get more than 50 gray. With this fractionation, what is the tolerance dose if, you, if, you fraction, if your fractions become five? Okay. So say this, this, is, this is something pretty realistic. The patient comes to the clinic, and um, the doctor sees the patient and says, boy, this tumor is so big. Um, I would treat this with 50 gray, 20, two times 25, and then the neurosurgeon comes in and goes, you know what, let's just treat this patient with stereotactic degree therapy. You know, the tumor's a little big, but I think the patient can tolerate it. So this actually happens. So what would you do? Um, what kind of, what dose per fraction would you come up with? Okay, if the fraction number is five. So you want, you want to just do this one? How many slides? Are there? A lot of slides left. Actually, I think this is, this is an assignment question. And I posted the answers, by the way. It's not handed your assignment. I just posted the questions in a bunch of, uh, I think it's, you know, we can bring it up. So let's move on, and then I'll bring up the assignments. Huh? You have it up? There's there... a similar question, uh -huh. but I don't see this exact one. There's a brain stem. Tolerance goes to the brain stem, and one fraction is 12, what's the tolerance? Oh, okay. Well, the way you would do this one, it's really similar to the other one. So you'd say BED equals 25 times um, 200 in gray. So 25 times 2, 1 plus um, 2 over. Now, would I use 10? No, because it's an OER. Okay, an OER is a late responding tissue organ or risk. It's healthy tissue. It responds late. So we can use an alpha beta of either two or three. Let's just pick three. Okay, so what does that come to? Can somebody do that? 1.667 times 50. Then down here, so now we're going to go to five fractions. So it becomes five, the equation becomes five times D, one plus D over three equals 83.35. Okay, so that becomes, uh, so five D, I kind of ran out of, uh, so it's five D plus. 5d squared over 3. 5d plus 5d squared over 3 equals, is this right? 83.35? I think that's right, huh? Help me out. It's been a while. <laughs> What's that equation? Ah. Uh, negative d plus or minus squared d squared minus four c over two a. Four c over two a, right? Okay, thanks. Okay. And b is five thirds. No, b is um, b is five. Yeah. Right. Actually, I have to bring this eighty three over. So. Okay. So. Sorry? If you multiply the 3 out. You can multiply the 3 out, okay. So then B is 15. 
so you know so you don't end up with fractions. Okay, so B equals fifteen. A equals five. And C equals what's three times? A three point three five. Negative, or if you keep the negative, it's 250. Negative 250? Yeah. Okay. All right, so, so minus 15, so minus square root of b squared, um, 275, right? 275. 225? 225. Oh. 25. Minus uh, 20 times so 5,000. 5, 10. So this cancels, you can put a 1.5 here. You're going to get plus 5,000. Yeah, because the C's negative as well. Oh, C's negative, that's right. Oh, well, this is just going to make this 1.5. That's okay. Please attack. Ah. Okay. 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 Square root of this thing. 72.3. That's the square root of this? Yeah. Okay. 72.3. So 15. Okay, it's obviously. Yeah. So we're getting up with. Uh, all right, so 15 minus. But, so you should have a smaller number here. Uh, yeah. And you're getting a. Eight, seven. Ah, that's it. That's it. That's the only one. Eight point seven gray, thank you. So eight point seven gray times five is equal to for the OAR, for the OAR to get the same uh, the same biological effectiveness, the same biological effect, um, we're gonna treat it at eight point five. So if our tolerance at twenty five fractions times two hundred centigrade A is fifty gray, our new tolerance at five fractions is eight point seven gray uh, per fraction. Five fractions. We don't know how much dose we're going to do, but that's the tolerance. Okay, now there are um, the, there are tables, there's papers, there's a couple of papers that we have at Evanston that have tables of all this stuff. So you can go and look at the number of fractions you want to treat compared to um, the number of fractions with external beam. And so you don't have to do all this math. There's tables, there's papers that, of tables that have been calculated. Okay, let's keep going. I just want to double check this is dose. No, that's the, that's the total dose. Yeah. Dose per fraction. No, no, it's dose per fraction. Yeah, 8.7 is very per fraction. Okay. So, uh, SRS treatment planning. So, we talked about uh, sites, tolerance doses, now into planning. So this is a whole other animal. Um, in planning, the first step is imaging. MRI used for anatomical contouring. We can fuse the CT to get special accuracy and avoid distortion. We know about that. MLC-based plans. There's a couple of methods we could deliver the MLC-based plans. The advantage, of course, with MLC is that you can, you can shake the MLCs around the tumor. Okay? And you can say, well, I want two millimeter margins from the tumor, and the MLCs will come tight around the tumor. Uh, you could either treat dynamic and formal. Dynamic and formal means that as the gantry arcs are on the tumor, the MLCs will, sh will change shape based on the projection of the tumor. Okay? So that's dynamic and formal. This actually gives a really conformal, very nice plan. Or you could do IMRT. We don't, we don't see the advantage of IMRT in, in most cases. 
for cranial radius surgery just because dynamic conformal works really well. That doesn't mean that there isn't an advantage for certain cases, especially cases where the tumor is really close to the, uh, to the um, optic pathway. The advantage of MLC over cones is conformality, dose efficiency. By dose efficiency, it means that um, for a certain number of MUs, you're delivering a lot of dose. So the field is large. Okay, compared to compared to treating through cones where you're setting up multiple ISIS centers, the field is really small. And you need a lot more MUs to treat with this than you do with uh, MLC. The cons of MLC based plans the maintenance, because you have to maintain the linear accelerator, you have to maintain the MLCs. And the penumbra is not as sharp for MLC as it is for cone based. For cone based plants, five to nine tar um, arcs are typically used, one or two isocenters. And the advantage of cones are the number is really sharp. Conformality is a challenge, of course, because you're all you're trying to pack spheres to cover a tumor. Okay, this is um this is a slide that shows a couple of things. First, it shows this conformity index. Say you do a plan and you're covering your tumor, and you play with your weights and your your uh, MLCs have shaped shaped the isodosis to the shape of the tumor. How do you know it's a good plan? What's a parameter? Okay. What do you guys do for, like for right now, for an external beam plan, what's, what do you think a parameter is for a good plan? What, what's a metric? What do you use to, to evaluate the plan? Numer let's say a numerical metric. Our tolerance tables. Tolerance tables, right, because that, that tells you um, that you're sparing your healthy tissue. What else? DVH. DVH. Okay, your DVH is telling you your coverage level. Okay. Now, the DVH is fine. Uh, a DVH is fine, but it doesn't give you the whole picture. Okay? There's this other index called the conformity index. This is something that's used in radio surgery. And this conformity, there's several conformity indexes on indices out there. This one is the paddock conformity index. And the way the paddock conformity index works is it takes, it calculates, this is after the plan is done, it calculates the volume of the prescription isodose line. So say the doctor wants to wants to use the 90% prescription isodiotis line as the cover zone. So it looks at the volume of that line, actually the volume of that um, surface, no, the volume of that um, solid, uh, I mean, it's, it's a surface, it's wherever the volume is inside the surface, times the volume of the PTV, okay, and it, then it divides it by um, the square of the volume of the prescription volume, so it's these two intersections. Okay. And so the intersection, so here's an example. Prescription isodose line looks like this. It's not, that's not great coverage, right? So it's off a little bit. So it's going to look, the paddock conformity index takes the, the intersection of these two, which is this area here. Okay. And that's what it divides this by. And then the numerator is the volume of the prescription, this volume, times the volume of that. Right. And the closer that is to one, the better. So that, that conformity index ensures that as, as that conformity index becomes closer and closer to one, that means that the isodoses become tighter and tighter around the tumor. Okay. So you'll see that when you do in radio surgery planning, you'll see, um, you'll see paddock conformity index or conformity index. Do we use that that often? Not that much. Okay. But it's a numerical number that, we, that you can look at just to see what your conformity is. But we don't use that as much as we use a DBH. We use DBH is more, we look at isodose distributions more, we go through slices and make sure that isodose is covered. But this is a really quick, fast metric. Um, and if you're in, if you do protocols, the protocols will require a certain level of conformity. They'll want that number to be uh, above a certain number. Okay, over here, there's a graph of um, three types of machines. The Perfection, Cyberknife, and Novellus machine, okay? Perfection, Perfection is kind of like the gamma knife on steroids. It's the gamma knife that you could do more conformal uh, radius surgery. Cyber knife, you guys know what that is. And then Novalis is an MLC based on accelerator. And so what they did with this study, with the study, the, um, these um, researchers did, is they looked at the number of metastases. And this is just, a, this is, I don't think this is real patient data. They just um, um, created, uh, created a patient and just conjured a lot of tumors. They looked at three, three tumors, six tumors, nine tumors, and 12 tumors inside this patient. And they looked at the conformity index, uh, the paddock conformity index for these three machines. And they found that for three tumors, the cyberknife and novalis had pretty similar conformities. 
And then the Perfection did better. So the Perfection is a is a pretty awesome machine. It does it does really good for me. And then they looked at six metastases, six tumors. This is treating all at once. And then they looked at the conformity index. And so this is where the CyberNav is starting to separate away from Novalis. Okay. And the reason, and then it, the trend kind of keeps going. And then CyberNav starts looking more like the uh, Perfection. And Novalis is down here. And the reason that is is because the Novalis treats a larger area. And it's usually treating the entire tumor. And these two, these two here are treating a smaller area, and they're a lot more conformant. Okay, like a cyber knife, it, what it does is it, it's cone-based, but it delivers, it delivers it not in spheres. It can deliver it in linear. It, can, it has a lot of control points, so it's not restricted to, it's not restricted to arcs. So it can be a lot more conformal than MLC-based. So this is just a study that showed that these two machines were more conformal for, for more metastases than Novalis. Okay. Now, we very rarely treat anything above, above three. Okay. So for, for most patients, 99% of the patients, MLC-based treatments are comparable to cyber, the conformality. Okay, here's a picture of a zoomed up picture of an MRI. And this is a special kind of MRI. I believe this is called, this sequence is called a PS docking. And it really highlights the trigeminal nerve. Okay, so that's the trigeminal nerve. And what you're seeing here is our isocenter. We put our isocenter right there. And these are the isodose lines. That's it. And so the dose, we treat with a four millimeter cone, and that's all we treat. So can you imagine how hard it is to hit that target? I mean, it almost seems, I mean, it's really scary treating for an order because it's just, it's hard to believe that the system could be that accurate, but it is. And then here's the, um, this looks like a pinhead. Here's the, here's the arcs. Okay, so we've got, typically we have seven arcs that go around the patient. And we try to spread the dose as much as we can. This is 90 gray, in one shot. Okay, pituitary, another pretty common tumor that we treat. The challenge in pituitary is staying away from the brainstem and staying away from the optic chiasm, which is up here. Okay, and the way we treat, we treat it, and this one has one, two, three, this one has five arcs. And what we do to stay away from the, the, from the optic chiasm is these arcs here, we make them half beams. Okay, so when we treat when we treat from the side, the isocenter is up here like this. So there's no divergence. Okay, and so that helps that helps to reduce the dose in this direction. So every I mean every tumor and every tumor has its technique. This is a meningioma. Okay, and this is some high degree of conformality with MLC based planning. So you can do this, these kinds of shaping. You could do it with CyberNet too, you could do it with perfection. Um, with gamma knife, not so much. You can't really do that with these, uh, these isodose lines can kind of shape around in this direction. Okay. Uh, this is, a, this is a, what is this? This looks like, what is it is now? Oh, it looks like another pituitary. So by restricting the dose in one direction, what ends up happening is that the dose spills in another direction. Okay. You can't restrict the dose on one side without having to spill in the other. Why is that? Because um, if you want to restrict the dose, if you've got a beam coming in this way, and you and your isodose lines come up like this, well, the way to get rid of those isodose lines is to get rid of that beam. So if there's no dose coming from this direction, then most of the dose will predominantly come from this direction. I mean, it's got to come from somewhere. Okay? So that spreads the dose out in that direction. And when you're planning, you need to know you need to know um, how how the isodoses are going to behave. This is an example. This is the same big tumor that we had before. Okay, so role of imaging in stereotactic radiotherapy. So that invasive frame, we're pretty confident about the patient's set. But the minute that we, we do fractionation and we relocate the patient, there's some uncertainty, and we know that. So we can, we can apply margins. But say, so imaging comes along now. Imaging, IGRT, OBI, exact track, all those imaging modalities. So now they allow us to image the patient very accurately and ensure that the patient's in the right spot. Okay, so this is a new tool we have now. And with this new tool, what can we do? We can shrink the margins again. Okay, we can bring them down. We can shrink them down smaller than, than they were uh, when we didn't have it. So we can assess for correct patient's position with imaging. We can correct for mask fit variability. So from day to day, the patient might fit in the mask differently. Uh, we, use, we do this by comparing it to the DRRs from the plan. Okay. And we make adjustments on the couch. 
and uh, many centers are using just regular regular couch and regular OBI. Okay, so here's a this is a this is the picture of the Atlantic Evanston Hospital right here. Looks familiar. Okay. With a beautiful view of this forest behind it. <laughs> they got this, they got these templates for the closets for the air cabinets. Um, so anyway, that's that's our Linux accelerator, and there's a couple of special special things. And this is still we're still talking about imaging here. There's two subfloor X-ray tubes directed to amorphous silicon panels. Okay, so these two X-ray tubes. There's one X-ray tube here under this home plate. There's another one under this home plate. And the patient lies down on the couch. They're brought up to ISO center, and the head is up here, and we can image the position of this head with this with this plate, and then we get the stereoscopic aspect by imaging from another direction. And so we do that before every, before every fraction. That's the computer that runs the exact track system. And that's the x-ray generator. Uh, I don't know if you need to know that one. There's a, OK, now we also have a 6D robotic couch. This is, thing is fantastic. Because this thing will pitch, it will turn this direction, and it will roll. Too. So if the patient's lying down in their mask, and somehow they've done this, and they've been set up that way, with a regular couch, you can't cart for that. With a, with a robotic 60 robotic couch, you can. Okay. Of course, the imaging system has to be able to detect that. All right. So here's a here's a couple of screenshots of what the robotic couch can do. Okay. So this currently is a brain it's a brain lab couch, and it gets you can buy it for um, for varying machines. The load is not that high. It's only 300. A regular couch goes up to 450. Okay. And so here's. Here's how the Zach trick works. Here's how imaging works. Uh, we'll take, this is a picture of, let's see, this outside picture is a picture of the x-ray we just, we just took of the patient. This is one tube and this is the other tube. And this is a spyglass, a little square, which is where the DRR from the plant fits. And we can move this thing around and compare it to our current picture. Okay. And it actually has automatic fusion, so it'll fuse the two. And after it's done the fusion, it'll tell us what our shifts have to be. So it'll tell us our couch shifts. It also gives us, these are just translational. It also gives us angulation shifts. It tells us what our couch shift is. OK, that's huge. Okay, we usually don't see 7 millimeters. Okay, And then we move the couch into position. And then we reshoot the x-rays to verify. And usually when we reshoot them, we're less than 0 0.5 millimeters. So it's an extremely accurate system. OBI is not, that, not as accurate as that. So what does this give us? Look at that. We're within 0.5 millimeters accuracy. That's almost, we're almost talking about the accuracy of the invasive head frame now. Okay, so we can, again, shrink the margins. and gives us a lot of confidence about um, what we're treating. Okay, and patient setup. So this is basically how we set up a patient. These, uh, these infrared reflective markers right here are monitored by an infrared camera that's in the ceiling. So when the couch moves, Everything's being monitored. The infrared camera is monitoring this as it's as it's shifting the couch around. So, it, so that's how it, it gets its feedback. So it knows where it's going. Okay. So and so with all this new technology, we got to do all new QA tests. So you have to. Our job is to understand how this works and do the QA that the manufacturer recommends. And we have to know how to pick up red flags if there's an issue. So so there's a lot of QA involved. This is another system. This is the RT Align system. So the patient lies down in here. This is a mouthpiece. And then there's cameras in the room that monitor the patient's position. And what they do, they're really cool cameras because they map the surface of the patient. Okay, so one color is the current, current patient's position. And the other color is the patient's position in CT, where the plant comes from. And so they, they lay the patient down. And this system actually moves the couch into the proper position, and it melds the two surfaces together. Okay. The advantage here, there's no x-rays. You don't have to take any x-rays. Uh, and then you're, um, for breasts, it's for, for, they use this for breasts because it's better aligned breasts based on the surface um, compared to taking x-rays. So that's the RT Align system. They use it, they use it at uh, University of Chicago. Now, RT Align setup, this is interesting. RT Align setup accuracy can be affected by facial expression change and possible weight changes. So if the patient's smiling in the sin and then frowning in the treatment room, it's not going to be able to detect it. It's going to have a problem detecting the difference. 
So this is obviously this is only an issue for, for SRS when you're looking at the face. You're not gonna you're not gonna look at this stuff for SRS. You're gonna look up here for SRS. Okay, so this system has some limitations. Conclusion: The OSI system is capable of detecting. Look at that 0.1 millimeter. So it's extremely accurate. Of a phantom near real time. Uh, so as the patient moves, it can detect it in real time. This new frameless SRS procedure using maskless head fixation system provides a mobilization similar to that of conventional frame-based SRS. Head motion monitoring using Neo real-time surface imaging provides adequate accuracy and is necessary for frameless SRS. So the advantage here is that you're not using this mask and the patients aren't claustrophobic. It's kind of it's more open. Okay, so here's some dedicated Linux. I told you um, the variant trilogy is a dedicated Linux. We have one of these at Evanston. 1,000 MU, 1000 MU per minute. This is great because you can get the treatment done quickly. Why is that important getting the treatment done? The longer they're on the table, the more they can move. Yeah. OBI and CBCT available, 120 leaf MLC, or you can get cones for the Linux. Uh, Brain Lab Novalis TX, that's the newer Brain Lab uh, machine. It kinda, it's kind of like a trilogy with a high definition MLC. And a robotic 60 pouch. Okay, it's really the same thing with a couple of extra things. Cyberknife, you guys know about Cyberknife. And then Electa Axis, that's the, uh, the Electa Stereotactic specific Linux. Gamma Knife SRS, and we talked about this a little bit, has 201 cobalt 60 sources, very precise for patient positioning, no moving parts except the couch. Um, you can use multiple isocenters to get conformity. Long treatment time is due to reposition the patient for each isocenter, so you have to move the patient for each isocenter. And there's many isocenters at times. And you have to change the sources out every five years. It's approximately half life of cobalt. Extremely expensive to do that. And then here's the collimator helmet. So the patient, <clears throat> the patient has an invasive head frame, and this they get they get docked to this helmet. Okay, so each of these little each of these little cylinders is a is a collimator that lets the cobalt 60 radiation through. And you can pull these out. If you don't want to treat certain ones, you can pull them out and block them. So you, if you don't want to treat from that, from that direction. Okay. So they're Lexing Brothers and Northwestern. That's what they have. Cyberknife. So there's a tiny Linac in there. Well, there's a smaller Linac in there, and then um, the robotic, the robotic move again. It doesn't move in a circular pattern. It can move in, in uh, many ways, cone-based, and it's not isocentric. And then the perfection is the newer gamma knife, and the difference between the perfection is that the sources move. Okay, so they can, the, in the old gamma knife, the sources were stable. In this one, the sources can move, and they can, when they move, they can move to different collimator sizes. So the patient doesn't need to move around. Okay, 100, this one has fewer cobalt sources attached to eight movable sectors, and there's higher conformality of acidosis than the older human. The variant has a Jubim STX, next generation. This STX has 2,500 mmHg per minute. Treatments, again, are even shorter. Improved OBI, geometric accuracy. It has a robotic couch, and um, I believe they're using the brain lab couch. And then MLC tracking. What they're going to do in the future is MLC tracking. So as the patient breathes, more for more for breathing, more for SPRT as the patient breathes, the MLCs will track. It'll be it'll move around as, as the tumor moves. And then this is a new, a really neat unit. There are already sent to show this at the uh, at the trade shows. It's called a Vero. It's a Mitsubishi Brain Lab uh, joint venture. It's a rotating Linac, kind of like a tomotherapy unit. Linac rotates. 185 degrees plus 60 degrees in the other direction. So it can rotate in this direction as well. So it gives you more degrees of freedom. MLC moves independently. It's on a gimbal and moves on its own. The exocenter accuracy is really good, 0.1 millimeters, and it's intended, the main purpose is to treat moving targets. So that will be, we're going to start seeing those pretty soon. And that couch, by the way, oh well, yeah, that's the same couch we have at Evanston, or a robotic couch. So conclusions, SRS delivery of accurate, uh, SRS is delivery of accurate and large doses on a short time is achieved through the use of specialized equipment. Accurate imaging phasing out invasive head ring. Okay, so invasive head ring, this is something I didn't say, but the invasive head ring is starting to disappear because we've got imaging and we trust our imaging and we can get accuracies 
um, that are just as good as the invasive headering. Fractionation increases possible candidates for SRS. Okay, so fractionation allows us to treat more patients and different uh, larger tumors and tumors that are closer to critical structures. And the machines offer faster treatment delivery and more tumor tracking. That's it. That was 43 slides. Those cybernetics are selling like hotcakes, though. I don't know. Those, they're so expensive. And uh, the patients on the table for a long time, 